Okay, I think I think we start now. So um, I want to welcome you all. If you if you have filled in all your little yellow and blue cards, you can still do that uh, during during the, the session. If you want, I think we'll. It all goes to Adrian later on, and he will immediately analyze the data <laughs> as a social scientist. So I wanted to uh, welcome you all to this uh, session. You okay, go one back on the this. Uh, so to the, to the session understanding uh, the organic consumer. So so my I'm, I'm my name is Ulrich Schmutz. I'm a professor for organic horticulture and ecological economics. And uh, some of this work comes out of projects I'm involved in, or I was the principal investigator, namely um, Organic Plus. And we have actually two sessions, which is inspired by this project. Uh, and what is important for me was always that we do at Coventry University, at uh, the site, do transdisciplinary research. So that means we, we work also on the technical issues of organic farming, organic horticulture, but also on understanding the consumers. And we try to link them together in this kind of ambitious word of transdisciplinary research. But, uh, you know, we can, we can debate that later. So we are, we are at Wrighton, you have seen um, out there is a stand outside, and um, we are based at a place called Wrighton Organic Gardens, which used to be the place where Garden Organic, or still is, is based there, uh, but Covent University now uh, bought the site, and there's a little cluster of other uh, organic units there, for example, the Heritage Seed Library uh, of, is there, there is the um, a uh, five acre farm, a community supported agricultural scheme, and as also best in horticulture. So, so this is the cluster where, where, we, where we are. And um, I've, I've been just in Korea uh, for a conference there, and it's about uh, 50 years of organic um, uh, farming, especially the, the founding of IFOAM, the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements. And, and the discussion there and this headline there was also uh, organic for all. So in a way, we, we are at, at a time where organic really needs to go away from its kind of niches and reaching more consumers, all consumers. That links also to the previous session we had uh, in terms of the cost of living crisis. Um, so so I, I think for this session, I'm, I'm very much interested in this opportunities we have now, you know, kind of, I always call it almost, we have kind of double Brexit, I mentioned the B word now, sorry. <laughs> but on the double, on the second part is that we have also the opportunity in the four nations of the UK to create some kind of a better understanding of uh, agriculture. And then technically we even have the possibility to develop our own organic standard in, in England or Wales or Scotland. Uh, that is, and for that reason, I think it's also interesting to to look what Rebecca said earlier this this morning uh, to to move to uh, to the great three lands. She, she said in terms of having a very different type of um, uh, organic um, horticulture, not so much on the on the best lands, which we have this issue with peat. And and the fifth thought I wanted to uh, put in. So when I started kind of working on this area, the supermarket share in terms of organic, and that was about 20 years ago, was 84%. So the supermarket had a market share of 84% in 2002 or three. In the latest soil association market report, uh, 2022, the share of the supermarkets is only 64%. So, so we have seen clearly peak supermarket in terms of organic, it's going down. And, and I think we haven't really understood the consumer fully, why is all this happening? Uh, by, by the way, by that time, obviously the organic market has grown a lot. So basically there is, there's now 36% of organic somewhere else than supermarkets. And some of it is growing fast, cosmetics, textiles. So these are kind of the, opening scene, I see this kind of devolution um, opportunity, but then also this big supermarket opportunity. So I hope you 
you know, we want to engage in a discussion. We have only two speakers and I introduce them now. And then we have a, a lot of time to, to discuss that. And maybe I have triggered already some discussion. So the first speaker we, we invite is, um, is uh, Adrian. And he's uh, also an uh, associate professor at, at Coventry University. We work together on this work on organic plus and food diverse. And then we have the second speaker, Steve Jacobs from the Organic Farmers and Growers. Okay, so over to you, Adrian. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I might have to lower this slightly. Yes, do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Auric. Um, so I'm going to have to juggle my laptop and these. Hopefully, it'll work. Um, okay. So before I um, go in more depth about some of the research findings we have about consumers, I wanted to mention, or Auric's already briefly mentioned, but I wanted to mention the kind of the two projects that made some of this research into consumers possible. Uh, so the first one is the Organic Plus project. Um, so this uh, is a transdisciplinary project, so it had uh, a big natural science component. Um, organic Plus was basically looking at contentious inputs in organic agriculture uh, and looking how to phase them out. Uh, so things like copper, synthetic vitamins, peats, etc. Um, and you can see they had several different uh, work packages within the project, some of which were natural science. But we also had the opportunity to do some social science research looking at uh, consumers of organic food and in particular consumers views about contentious issues and inputs within organic. Uh, project lasted four years and it's coming to an end uh, at the end of this month. Um, so that's the first one, the organic plus. The next one I wanted to talk about was, uh, it's a kind of a, a spin-off, but slightly different because it's just a social science project. And this is called Food Diverse. So fortunately the names give you a clue for both of them. So this is about uh, diversifying uh, uh, food systems, particularly organic and sustainable food systems. And for this, we have a fairly broad uh, view of what diversity is. So it's diversity in food cultures and eating, what, what could be the benefits of, of diverse diets, it's diversity in terms of food supply chains. And in particular, we compared uh, mainstream with short food supply chains with more uh, catering and public procurement type chains. And then finally, looking at food governance, what types of policies enable and inhibit uh, greater diversity of, of food. Uh, so this was also a European funded project, Core Organic and Sus Food, and funded by DEFRA as a partner in the UK, and that's across five European countries. So through both of these projects, we've been able to do some research uh, with consumers about uh, uh, organic uh, food consumption. So the first piece of research I wanted to talk about is the, the Organic Plus uh, big consumer survey that we did. So this was primarily focused on contentious inputs in organic agriculture. You have to tell me if I don't. Yeah, yeah. Move forward on that. What's the ball? <laughs> okay. So this was primarily focused on, on contentious inputs in organic agriculture. It was a very big survey, fifteen thousand respondents. So it's representative in each of those seven countries: France, Germany, Italy, Norway, Poland, Spain, and UK. Um, and I, if you're interested, I recommend the report is available on the Organic Plus uh, website. Uh, the lead authors were our Norwegian team based in the Consumer Institute in Norway, CIFO, um, and you can find the full report uh, on that link. But if you just Google Organic Plus and go into the deliverables section, you'll be able to see it. Um, and that has a lot more detail than I'm able to cover. Okay, so that's now to talk about some of... So what I thought I'd do is I'll present some kind of initial find findings uh, from, from the survey. Um, and hopefully this will uh, prompt some discussions and thoughts uh, afterwards. So um, the first very basic point was just to look at um, the frequency of organic consumption. 
And I think there's a, there's a couple of interesting points here. I mean, the, f the first point is uh, the vast majority of people across all the countries and, and also in the UK were consuming organic food, at least at some stage in the last month. So if you look at the never, the never and the don't knows, they only take up about 30% uh, in the UK. So that means around 70% of people are consuming organic food at, at least sometime. Okay. The other point I wanted to highlight was, and the UK stuck out from the other countries in this regard, was the never category. The average across all the other countries was just under 15% who would never uh, have the organic food. Whereas in the UK, this was noticeably high for people who had never uh, tried it. And I think maybe the explanation for this lies a bit in the, in the next slide. Um, so this is the same thing, looking at the frequency of organic consumption, but breaking it down by income. And you can see there's a really, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> you can see, you can see there's a really clear pattern here um, and how income uh, impacts the frequency of eating organic food. So if you look at the, the daily one, you can see you know, the high incomes, are far, high income groups are far more likely to be eating uh, organic food regularly. Whereas it switches and the, the slope is the other way around for the never. It's the uh, people on low incomes are, are more likely to have not consumed organic food, which is maybe you'd expect that. But if you compare that to another country like Italy, you can see it's a much flatter profile and uh, income is not making a huge difference in terms of uh, frequency of eating organic food. So it's a very different profile in Italy uh, compared to the UK. So we might wonder why the UK consumers seem to be more price sensitive. Okay, so then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the more kind of values associated with organic food that, that we found in the survey. Uh, so they were asked, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? Uh, organic food is better for, and then there's a whole list of things, uh, health, environment, animal welfare, etc. And I think this is, in some ways, this is a really good news story because you can see that uh, around 60% across all of these categories are either completely agreeing or um, agreeing. So there are these, these two, completely agree and agree. Um, so you can see across all of these across all of these categories, there there is kind of a consensus that is organic is doing well in these areas. But then I guess on the flip side, there is a lot of don't knows and a lot of neutrals. So maybe there is scope for that message about um, some of the good values that organic food uh, embodies that that still needs uh, the case still needs to be made. Okay, and then. Carrying on with these kind of values, this was more looking at the negative side uh, and issues like availability, expense, lack of information. And again, it's quite positive. People uh, were tending to be disagreeing with these, um, except, uh, and there's a pattern emerging here, and you'll see this, for the UK, there seemed to be a lot of agreement that organic food uh, was too expensive. So that's the second. Uh, Second row, you can see there's quite a large percentage of people who did agree with that statement that it was too expensive. So this, this is interesting. This is looking at, this was done across all the countries and looking at uh, recognition of different labels. So, and I think there's a few interesting points to note here. So, um, Firstly, you, as you'd expect, certain labels have quite a high, uh, people were able to recognize them quite easily, like the Soil Association. Far less uh, people recognize the EU organic uh, label. There it is on the top right, you can see in the green. Um, and, and labels like Demeter, weren't, this is just in the UK, weren't that recognized. And then also, interestingly, people tend to associate labels that weren't necessarily organic, uh, things like fair trade and animal welfare and uh, origin labels, people thought were organic. So again, there's some uh, confusion still and some scope for, for uh, clarifying. 
then um, this is interesting because it looks at the range of things that consumers consider important in relation to a particular product, and this is chicken. Um, and you can see where the organic fits in with a kind of range of other uh, issues. So uh, something like chicken, uh, as you'd expect, maybe things, the practical things like taste, best before date, price, um, come up really highly in terms of people thinking they're important across all countries, pretty much. Um, and then you get a range of other issues like country of origin, animal welfare, local, and then organic pr production comes up fairly highly in that list as something that's important in relation to chicken. Uh, the, some of the yellow highlights indicate the countries that were slightly above the, the national average for those particular issues. So the UK on the pr on price that came up as being uh, more important than the other European countries for buying chicken. Um, and then in Poland, for example, there seemed to be more than average value given to organic production. Italy, the Italians considered everything to be more important. That's why there's a lot of yellow. Um, and then that's chicken. I think it is really interesting to differentiate between different products because it obviously makes a huge difference. So if we look now at apples, um, we can see is a similar picture in terms of uh, practical properties, taste, freshness, appearance, uh, being really important. Um, and then again, a range of uh, other issues. And, and you can see organic comes in there uh, somewhere around that level, uh, around kind of mid uh, threes of importance. Uh, a maximum is five is very important, and zero is important too. Um, and again, the UK sticks out in relation to the other countries in relation to price. Okay, so the, one of the main purposes of the survey was to look at um, contentious issues and inputs in organic agriculture. Uh, and that was to tie in with some of the work the natural scientists were doing uh, around these issues and, and trying to phase out some of these contentious uh, inputs. Uh, so we asked uh, all the consumers about um, a variety of different inputs. Now, some of oh, so some of these were uh, taken from the work that natural scientists were working on, like reducing antibiotics um, and uh, avoiding peat. Other issues came from uh, preliminary research with consumers about things that they found important. Uh, for example, avoiding plastic packaging. So I think there's, a, again, there's a couple of important points to note here. I wouldn't worry too much about the ranking of the different issues because they're all fairly similar in terms of importance. What is interesting perhaps is the percentage uh, who with no opinion or don't know. So I hope you can all see that on the right. So you can see for a lot of the issues, and this is broken up, uh, regular organic consumers are in the green and the purple is, uh, other consumers. Um, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, no opinion or don't knows about, about these issues. Um, so again, there's a lot of scope uh, for messaging here. Um, the other thing to note, and you'd, hopefully you'd expect this, is organic consumers did seem to give more importance than just regular consumers to a lot of these issues. And then I said the rank isn't important, but just to mention, I think antibiotics did come high and so did copper as, as issues that consumers felt were important. Okay, following on from this, we, we asked about um, consumers kind of willingness to pay for these. Um, so for example, I'm showing the example of antibiotics here. So they were asked uh, if placing stricter controls on the use of antibiotics increase the price of organic food, would you be willing to pay more? And it's, it's very small, but the top is uh, yes, and it's no, and don't know. So you can see that there is, there's a kind of an equal split between people in a lot of the countries about whether they would or wouldn't be prepared to pay more. But you do notice some differences. And I think you probably can say Italy, Poland, uh, and to a less extent, Germany seems to be more willing to pay for these kind of improvements whereas UK and France may be less, slightly less willing to pay. You can see the middle line is slightly uh, bigger.
Okay, so I have a couple more slides left, as well as, uh, so that was kind of from the big 15,000 representative uh, survey across Europe. We also did some more in-depth uh, qualitative research with consumers, uh, focus groups, where we were able to have more in-depth discussions. Um, some of these we did uh, as part of the Organic Plus project, uh, and others we did more recently as part of the Foodiverse project. And again, we divided them into groups of more or less frequent organic consumers. The sessions lasted around about two hours uh, and we did them in various countries. The Organic Plus, we did in the UK, Norway and Italy. Uh, not personally, we had Italian facilitators and Norwegian facilitators in the other countries. Um, and then um, the Foodiverse project was done in all the countries, but we just did the UK. Okay, so this is a summary uh, from the focus groups. We had an exercise where um, everybody present wrote down uh, what they associated with organic. So they, it wasn't structured in any way, they could write whatever they wanted. And then afterwards we kind of grouped them into uh, categories that seemed to make sense. So you can see, as you'd expect, environment, uh, health, but also consumer experience in terms of the kind of the taste and the quality. Those are the types of issues that came up again and again across different people. Um, one of the points to note, and this is qualitative research, is just suggestive rather than necessarily, it might be something that needs to be um, confirmed in more detail. Uh, but if you look, there does seem to be a difference between the more regular consumers and the group that contained uh, some regular and some not so regular. And that's mainly in regard to um, the, ex the extent to which they're focusing about environmental issues compared to kind of human health issues. And it seemed to be that the people who, who are regular consumers of organic seem to discuss more of the environmental issues, whereas people who are less regular were focusing on some of the health attributes of organic instead. Then I think I have... Where's the chair going? Yeah. Okay, I think I have a couple more slides. Yeah, yeah. That's okay, good, good. <laughs> so, um, Auric mentioned before about kind of doing transdisciplinary research. And I think one of the things we tried to do, obviously with identifying contentious issues, inputs in organic agriculture, was partly driven by the scientists and looking at some of the issues that they knew were problems. And there's already been research done on and there's a kind of scientific community working on the issues, things like synthetic vitamins, antibiotics, copper use, mineral oils. But we also wanted to see uh, more generally what kind of issues consumers uh, thought were contentious uh, in organic food. And you can see immediately there's, there's differences in the way uh, the issues, for want of a better word, are framed between the two groups. So the scientists tend to, to focus on the kind of inputs, at the farm level, whereas the consumers don't necessarily have that specific knowledge, but what they do focus on is a broader range of issues across the food chain and connected to other kind of broader ethical issues as well. So things like plastic packaging, um, things <laughs> like um, having, is it right to have organic foods that are really processed and unhealthy? Um, and then things like uh, climate change, um, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, etc. So there's a range of different issues identified by the consumers. And I think part of the project, of what the project was about, was trying to get a dialogue between science and society and try and be that mutually beneficial in both directions. And this is my final slide. Okay. Um, so this this is this is some final observations from some of the uh, focus groups we did for food diverse, and this was just a, a difference we noticed between the frequent organic consumers and the less frequent organic consumers. And it seemed that for a lot of the, the, the frequent consumer group, they were really concerned about provenance. 
So everyone was interested in sustainability, but the ones who are more frequently consuming organic, uh, they were more likely to get their food from short food supply chains. And they talked a lot about their own connections to, to veg growing. Um, also, this extended to a kind of a connection to independent shops and producers. I mean, Auric was talking about peak supermarket before, so maybe that fits into this pattern somehow. Uh, in contrast, in, infrequent organic consumers seem to be more price conscious, uh, despite the fact that they actually had a similar income profile to the other group. Uh, this group saw uh, affordability as part of good food. Um, they were sometimes suspicious about profit motives around organic, and they talked about limits to what they thought was reasonably um, reasonable to pay. Um, and there could be several reasons for this, and maybe we could talk about this in the discussion. Um, is this because they're just better at allocating more budget to food, or is it to do with where they're sourcing their organic food from? And if they're sourcing it through short food supply chains, then um, maybe they have a different um, relationship uh, to price and, and a different view on, how, on uh, how competitive organic is. So that's the end of my. And I think we're gonna take questions after Steve's time as well. Thank, thank you. Yeah, so, so we take the second, um, it's not a presentation, so we, we had enough PowerPoints, that's it. <laughs> and the, I'll, I'll give you the word. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, uh, no PowerPoint, sorry, or well done, whichever your um, view on that. Hi, I'm Stephen Jacobs, I'm Business Development Manager from Organic Farmers and Growers. Uh, OFMG was formed in the 70s, actually, as a marketing cooperative, mainly for um, organic grain. Um, Craig Sams told me many years ago that him and Gregory started the whole earth by moving grain through OFMG in the 70s, so there you go. Um, what we do now is we certify the largest certifier of organic land in the country, and we certify from seed to shelf. My experience before working with OFG is market gardening, then farming, and then into retail and wholesale. Um, I've just made a few notes. One of the things I obviously wanted to say was um, we're obviously going through a massive crisis, or if you're in the political world, a series of massive crises. Um, but looking back, we do have an analog. In fact, I've got three to share with you. One, I think, is fairly obvious, and this is perhaps particularly pertinent following Adrian's really good presentation, is how people spend on organic it depends on the availability of organic to a large extent. So in the finance crisis in 2007-8, there was a big shift in the market. For organic. Turns out most of that shift, or a large part of it, was because the largest retailer of organic at the time, Tesco's, delisted about 30% of their range. They did it in an effort to beat the discounters. They thought it's a finance crisis, everybody's going to be skinned, we'll go for discount. We ran a conference in 2009, and the Tesco organic buyer at the time was a man called Alain Gilpin, um, a marvelously arrogant Frenchman. He was superb. And um, he, he spoke really well about the data. So the Tesco club card is built famously on the Dunhumby Foundation they collect data, they were the first to do it. Apparently David Sainsbury said, why would I want to do that? Obviously times have changed. They found that when they delisted the organic, a lot more, a, a deeper fall in till sales happened than they were expecting. Almost three times more than they were. So it turns out that an organic shopping basket, a customer buying some of the organic stuff at Tesco's is worth 2.7 times more than an average customer. 
that's because they buy organic, but it's also because they'll buy premium shampoo, et cetera, et cetera. So that he relisted their organic. It took them a while because obviously we lost some production during that time and they thought you could just turn it on and off. So that's one analog. Um, and how things are bettering out, we're not quite sure the data is not in. Some of you will know because you're already doing, you're very close to the market. Maybe we can have a chat about that in a minute. Um, one of the other ones I wanted to talk about was Horsegate. When um, I used to work at Essential Trading Cooperative in Bristol, big reason I'd be big, whole food wholesaler, mainly organic. When the horse meat scandal broke, everybody was knackered because so much business went through that warehouse. It, the sales growth grew by about 30%. And talking with people, the conclusion was people got so fed up with losing confidence with major retailers, they thought, I'm going back to the whole food shop or the health food shop. Essential delivers to around 1,500 independent whole food stroke health food shops all over the country. And if their sales shot up at a time of crisis, I think that says a lot. Another, um, obviously the third analog is the COVID-19 lockdown where we saw massive increase in online sales. Organic was able to pivot. Some businesses have managed to hold on to some of that extra business. Quite a lot of the businesses I've spoken to haven't. Where things go next, of course, we're not entirely sure. One of the things I wanted to say, and the reason why I'm not doing lots of stats, if you want stats, the Organic Trade Board do some very, very good data. I would urge you to uh, talk to them if you're not already a member, have a think about it. They do a farmer and grower rate. They've got events. The next one I think is coming up towards the end of this month. In that event will be us talking with our colleagues at the Soil Association about where organic is in the sort of general discussion around regenerative. And the reason I mention that is because I want to talk about the benefits of organic, the things that you can stand behind when you're facing the customer. Now, one of the things that we constantly get hit with, and I get hit with quite a lot because I have to work with the NFU, is yields. We've got to feed the world. I'll give you a couple of my ready responses. I'm sure you've got your own. One is around 800 million people today are hungry through no fault of their own. But around 2 billion are overweight. So there's 3 billion people globally, these are UNFAO stats, are in a situation where food has given them negative outcome. So the Green Revolution has not been able to solve that. I'm not attacking the Green Revolution. I could, but that's not an attack on it. I'm simply saying yield alone will not solve this problem. I'll give you some other facts. Um, around half the greenhouse gas footprint of a conventional loaf of bread is the manufacture and use of ammonia nitrate. The Sheffield University did a very good uh, piece of research on this. It's just over 40% of the greenhouse gas footprint of a loaf of bread is the manufacture and use of the artificial fertilizer. Couple that with another fact, this one from the Waste Resource and Action Program, RAP. They say that nearly half the bread bought into the home goes in the bin. So at a time of climate crisis, ecological collapse, and a finance crisis through energy price hikes, I would suggest yield as, as a meter, as a metaphor for anything of quality is redundant. Um, and obviously what goes with that is also the fact that organic delivers. So we know, and if any of you, again, if we want stats, I'm not gonna take up time here because I think we should have a conversation. But it, we've got a lot of data, particularly on public goods, particularly with um, iPhone in Europe. So that's the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements in Europe. 
We have some really good body of uh, data on biodiversity, on soil health, on water quality, on food quality. So I really just, uh, the other thing was the Kantar data was saying that one of the growth areas could be what they call ecoactives. The ecoactives are the, so there's ecoactives, eco passives, whatever it is, and eco dismissives. If you were to group your shoppers in that way, your ecoactives are likely to grow. It's around 30% they predict. This was prediction was before the current situation. I think, I think this came out at the end of last year. So they may have revised this that it would treble to around 60 something percent by 2030. Now, one of the things, just for a minute, one of the things I've noticed, and if you look at what happened with the Tesco situation, we didn't lose all of our organic customers because a retailer took it off the shelf. A lot of those organic customers found it somewhere else. A lot of them went to Aldi in Lidl. And Aldi and Lidl built up their ranges and have done quite well out of it. I also know growers who like Aldi and Lidl because they tell me they pay on time. Things like that are important. So I think that's it for me. I just, so just to finish off, it's obvious this is stuff you know, and I'd be really interested in your experience. Know your customer, listen to your customer, talk to your customer, all of that sort of stuff. Those are the things that the big companies do through whatever routes they do it through. Um, some people call it PR, other people call it BS. It's look them in the eye and tell them the truth. You can stand by organic because it is what it stands for. And we have the evidence. So I, I would urge you not to be shy of using the O word. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have uh, 15 minutes. So if you, there's a roving mic, mic and also questions from the chat. Um, so if anyone has, uh, has the first question, I would think maybe questions a little bit for Adrian first, if you have any direct questions following up on his talk and then we can, we can open it up. I can see one here, okay. So yeah, 15 minutes, go, go ahead. Please, you mentioned that humour was more price and more value on decision. But there wasn't any talk about what premiums different countries had for organic produce. Um, was any research done on, on that? I think this should work as well. Um, we, we didn't do uh, kind of market audits within um, Organic Plus. We did look at a bit of price data uh, within Food Diverse project um, that was in fewer countries. Um, my impression would be that this is more anecdotal, that there is a, a, a larger price gap in the UK than in certain other European countries. Yeah, say, that, 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 that's what I would have expected, which which, which then to the leverage. And I think, to the, I guess, from my take, there is a danger in us to the perceiving that organic problem due to price because we're more dependent on supermarkets that charge a serious premium. Whereas if you went to Italy, A, food is much more important culturally, but also it's much easier that produce that isn't from a major supermarket chain that isn't so if you've got a premium to organic versus uh, non-organic at 30 percent 40 percent and very often that doesn't necessarily mean yeah. the price the most important for a british consumer yeah um, i'd agree with that and i think some of the more qualitative research in the um the food diverse focus groups uh, and that split between the organic consumers who were sourcing their produce from short food supply chains were less, yeah, price came up less for them as an issue. So that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. yeah you want to comment on this? Maybe the next question you can come on that. But yes, comment on that. Um, yeah, and it's a really good question. Years ago, this was, so my memory of the stats may be a bit wobbly. Uh, in France, uh, multiple retailers have a market penetration or had 
of about 50%, and here it's nearer 80. So, and in France, we know that the organic market is stronger, that there's a left, less differential between non-organic and organic in terms of price. There's a different approach. So maybe one of the answers is to rewrite the whole thing and say, this is organic, it's got these values. Um, Ed Garner did a talk for us years ago, it was the um, communications director for Cantar, very funny man. If you ever get a chance to face, he's got lots of YouTube videos in which he does loads of data and loads of jokes. Um, well, he's, yeah, I can't do any of them here. It'll just, it, it'll disassociate members of the audience. But um, he said that the customer doesn't buy an organic carrot in Waitrose because, just because it's an organic carrot. It's an organic Chantenay carrot that was grown locally, et cetera, et cetera. So it's these layers of benefit. Organic is the bedrock, and then you build the identity off the back of that. And I would agree. Thank you. Let's have an online question first, and then we come home to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've, well, I've got two online, so you may okay. have to come back to me. They're, they're actually two likes and knows, but I think they might be just worth some follow up discussion yeah, to do on. some justice for the um, Julian Bishop. Um, what percentage of organic consumers buy for its health benefits versus environment versus its environmental benefits, or even if they actually care about either, which was um, Adrian, interesting observation there in the comparison between habitual organic consumers and um, is, it, is it worth just saying a little more about that? Because that was quite an interesting finding for us. Yeah, so I think um, that came out of the more qualitative research in terms of the areas that, that um, uh, participants in those focus groups associated with organic and they did seem to be the less frequent consumers. Uh, were more concerned about the health benefits. Um, I don't know if we have the quantitative data because I don't think we asked that question in the survey. I'd have to go and uh, check. But I, I do get that impression that there is, uh, the market is slightly differentiated in terms of what people are looking for from organic, if that helps. Mm -hmm. What was their second question on that? Yes, from Stuart Greenaway. Um, would like to know, do organic consumers tend to also eat seasonally or do they revert to non-organic for out-of-season produce? Uh, I, yeah. Do you want to yeah. Well, the short answer is I don't know. The long answer <laughs> is that one of the things that the Organic Trade Board did was to look at whether a customer could go into a retail outlet and get a whole menu. And that's really tricky. So that's why we see lots of imports out of season, et cetera, because they're trying to get a range of lines. And I don't think, yeah, I think so I would say instead of in season or out of season, I'll use another um, analog, seems to be my favorite word at the moment, but bread. It, 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 an organic customer is looking for a high quality, I would suggest. Otherwise, whether it's health, because um, it's their personal health or it's ecological health or they're what Kantar called eco-actives for a range of reasons. Um, they don't necessarily want a tin slice loaf, even if it is organic. They want a sourdough loaf that was, you know, that's got a lot of flavor. And um, Kimberly Bell from the small food baker in Nottingham put it to me like this. Appetite, nutrition, and flavor. That's what her customers are looking for. If they can get out organically, superb. I think one of the problems we've got is that we grow not very much fruit and veg in this country, and not very much of that is organic. So when it comes to in season, it's a very tricky one. Yeah, I mean, we don't have the kind of purchasing data and people switching patterns, but it was very clear from the discussions that these organic consumers really valued uh, local and seasonal produce. It was, it was um, part of their, the core values as well that they kind of expected uh, that should be associated with organic as, as key features. We've got more questions. Do you have the mic? There's one on the right side. But, well, okay, further on, I think he, he was first. And then there, and then there. Maybe we can... We've actually had the question come through, but it was between health. 
was the environmental impact that was way more of a um, a, a plus, which made so much we try. Two things are related, how environment, one in the same thing. So how can you get a, a, a result? Why it is so bad. So that, uh, we just try. No, we, no, but I'll give it to Adrian. But our, our thing is understanding the consumer. So, so we need to see where the consumer is at the moment, even if the consumer is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so Adrian. Uh, yeah, I think we have to be a bit careful how we in, interpret the data. So that, that particular graph was just from a small group of people participating in a, fo in a focus group. And it was, um, uh, it was more about the issues that they tended to prioritize dur during the discussions. So it wasn't that they were necessarily ranking one above the other. It just tended to be when they talked about organic and the virtues of organic amongst the less frequent consumers, health came up a lot, but in the other group, it tended to be more around um, environmental benefits. And whether that was because they were just more aware about some of the environmental benefits of organic food um, and ha had more knowledge on that side of things, whereas the less frequent consumers were more focused on health, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I think we have to be a bit careful how we interpret it. In terms of the consumer doesn't always know best, I think um, that that is true, but I think um, I think quite often the consumer is, is ignored and um, other, other views are prioritized. Um, I mean, I did a lot of work before this around uh, animal welfare, and it was really interesting seeing some of the uh, scientific approaches to what constitutes good animal welfare compared to members of the public. And obviously there's a huge gap in knowledge in terms of specific issues about farm animal welfare, but also there's um, a kind of a huge gap in expectation about what can be achieved as well. So I think it's always good to in incorporate different views and, and I think consumers can provide that. So I wouldn't reject consumers, yeah. And then maybe online. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm from a, well, I'm here today from a company called Organic North in Manchester. We're a, a fruit and veg wholesaler. And it was just a point, um, basically in response to the online question about whether organic consumers are interested in seasonality. We find, we supply about 200 Indies up and down the UK from Inverness to Penzance. And um, we take pride in being able to cover, uh, our sales increase a lot during the winter. Um, and drop off as people grow their own stuff. Loads of our customers grow their own stuff in the summer. And there's such a big gap just with the, the way the weather is, obviously, during the winter. And our diets are so far away from just eating neat and tatties for, for six months that in order for these small CSAs that we support and various other businesses up and down the country, um, I think it's important that we've got this consistency of supply so we can even have a chance of taking on the awful supermarkets um, and too many times I've only been to a couple of events like this this is my first ever OGA event it's, it's really interesting uh, also on a couple of weeks ago, short um, short scale supply chains and they just for me um, emphasis on it, if there isn't more of a nuance to be with not called Italy uh, the initial guy who spoke up there uh, about that. Um, to turn this around, um, surely we need to enfranchise people in in areas where there's food poverty and and try and get these new these new small scale growers going and supply in their area all year round if we can, so that they can invest more back into their polytunnels and extend the seasons and and really get it moving. And it's it's the uh, yeah I'm just sometimes. I mean, we, we enjoy that, that at work that we can support small scale growers and then they might not need us once they've got the, the gear going. That's, uh, that's fine with us. But yes, just that point. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't agree more. No, I couldn't agree more either. Um, 
one of the things that um, some people find useful to talk about is, is uh, bang for buck in the community. And again, the figure might be a little bit shaky. Don't hold me to this, but I think about if you spend every pound spent in the community, 60% stays, whereas a pound spent in the multiple retailer is the opposite. So it's that kind of thing. And absolutely, what's, why is food not affordable? Because salaries are suppressed. We know this. Um, there is no such thing as a trickle-down effect. I'm sorry if that's a plot spoiler. And so what do we do about that? Well, I can't, I'm not the chancellor, although you never know by Friday. You know? <laughs> um, but what we can do, exactly as you say, and I think the, the model that Organic North has done is excellent because you are growing with your suppliers and I think that's definitely the way forward how you balance the books overall <laughs> and during the hunger gap that's a headache I'm sure but yeah I, I completely agree embedded in the community can, can I add something yeah so I for food diverse one of the interesting things we found looking at the because uh, we're looking at food supply chains and comparing short food supply chains with kind of the mainstream supermarket and it was very clear that whilst it appears that there's a huge amount of choice of food in the supermarket, it's actually backed up by low diversity in monocultural farming on one side, and then also kind of standardized choices and diet by consumers. So they have a huge range of choice in the supermarket, but they tend to get the, the same products again and again and, and have the same meals. Whereas with short food supply chains on the... Uh, level of the producers there's more diversity more variety of crops grown um, than and then also uh, there was a bit of evidence to suggest that the diversity of the diets at the other end was higher as well because people were uh, trying things they wouldn't necessarily try when they were presented with things in their box schemes or the like so there's an interesting relationship between uh, diversity and the kind of supermarket choice model is a bit of a um, distraction in terms of diversity at the producer end and, and at the consumer diet end. And you must do that, do you? Try them with different things? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. We pride ourselves on this. Uh... With not just around the... Uh, almost, sorry, I was a bit uh, close there. Um, almost. There's an up to climate change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Well, there was one more question at the back. Um, Oh, there's two more. Okay. Well, we don't want to run over, but we will start it two minutes later. Otherwise, it's um, online. it was just a quick one. I just noticed, and it might be nothing, that um, issues with organic food from surveys, contentious issues, and one of them was listed as sufficient yield. Is this? Is it true that, like, do a lot of people look at inorganic as being just that much more productive? Or why, why, or maybe I misunderstood, but sufficient yield as listed. I took a photo from one of the slides 15 minutes ago. Hold yeah. on for the answer. Can we take the other two questions as well then? Because then everyone yeah. comes, well, I'll take three in, in together. Okay, uh, I'm Julius. I'm a research student from Newcastle Uni. And uh, that's quite interesting data there. Uh, my concern always about these presentations is uh, the way African production systems are never analyzed in such ma major research uh, you know, projects. And Africa has one of the most traditional production systems culturally, and that still is ongoing. And the concept about organic farming often tends to go towards that culture. And a lot of times when I look at this that the data, no one really bothers all this very limited funding to get information to that extent. We know most African governments 
borrow their policies from Europe and all these advanced uh, economies. So uh, as a comment, maybe it's, it's important to expand our research so that we can inform policy in the right way by understanding this different traditional production system. My mother's been growing the same seed of vegetables that she harvests from her previous vegetables for years. She doesn't buy seeds from the shop and it happens the same way in most communities. So it's quite an interesting uh, area to understand fast consumer behavior and even from a production perspective. And probably that brings out the question of food security. Is the food sufficient and why is it not sufficient? Is it because they're producing using those traditional methods that often organic systems advocate for? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So the next yeah. thing that, that, that so my, my question is now on biopesticides, uh, there's an issue of cost to uh, the cost to the organic farmer. I, I don't know if the, the farmers are saying that indeed biopesticides or these uh, pest control options are not as manageable for them because they're expensive and uh, may limit their profits, let's say, from their production. Has that view come out strongly that the inputs are, are a bit pricey and they are not able to sustain their production based on that? I can, I can comment to that. We have the final question. I think that was you in front with the blue. Yes, you did. You did have a question. <laughs> and then we'll try to wrap it up. In... Yes, thank you. Um, that came. talking about yields as well. And one other argument that is often used um, in the debate about yielding and feeding the world is the waste, uh, the food waste that is generated. If I'm not working it, it is how much of that waste would be organic? Otherwise, how much organic food is needed and whether there is any that there isn't much, or maybe there is a lot, I don't know, then that could add to the argument. Uh, I'm sure supermarkets or organic wholesalers have organic food waste. I don't know if anybody knows how much. And even box skin customers must waste some of the food they buy. So I th my question was about if there any data about food waste at all. Thank you. So yeah, but I would start with the first question because you made some, some notes and I, I can- Okay, yeah, well, should I just quickly run? Because I don't want because, you because to- Because they connect them, obviously the first and the third are connected. So um, in, in terms, in terms of yield and insufficient yield, I think, um, as Steve mentioned it in his talk as well, it's something that does come up a lot um, in uh, you know, can organic feed the world if we converted to organic. And I think the arguments that you put forward and that have been put forward here are, are spot on about the amount of food we waste. The other issue is obviously the amount of food we feed to animals intensively produced as well. and and. I think certainly if we see those as joined up problems and we need to think about modifying diets and reducing food waste, I, th I think um, that's the perfect way to, to counter arguments about, about yield and organic. Um, in terms of waste, I think it's a really important question about organic food waste, and that's really interesting, and also box schemes. I don't have, uh, maybe, one, maybe you two have data, but I mean, I haven't got any specific data uh, but I know there has been research done on wastage in box schemes and a lot of uh, you know, strategies put in place to avoid wastage by uh, box schemes. Uh, I mean, obviously, people tend to waste things that are more, tend to waste less if it's more valued as a product. So you'd imagine organic would fit into that category. Um, and then uh, in, just quickly with the African issue, I, I agree. I mean, these research projects were funded by the EU, mainly with an EU focus, or it will tell you there were other member partners outside of the EU. Um, also, the, the centre I work for in Coventry, 
we do a lot of research in Africa as well. So there is that that is definitely uh, some, something we, we look at. This, there was a specific question about bio pesticides, which maybe or it was going to, uh, but maybe maybe Steve I, first. I say or, okay. no, no, because the bio, I just one sentence. We, we did um, work on copper as well, and, and copper is one of the things which is always held against organic because we're still using it. Um, but the alternatives are now there. They are maybe slightly more expensive. Um, but we can at least recommend that's what we will do for the EU to reduce the copper use, slash, slash it by half again um, over the next seven years. And, and, and even if the costs are a little bit higher, um, because it's only uh, for pest control and the overall budget of, of the production, it doesn't make such a, such a big issue. So we can get rid of copper and use alternatives, which is all, not always pesticide. It could be system solution, plant, uh, uh, defense stimulation. So, so you got to work with the plants and make them stronger. <laughs> um, just quickly on copper, nobody's using copper at the moment because it's off the chemical use directive. That's been for a couple of years. Yeah, and will be for the foreseeable. So um, yeah, so it's a bit of a concern for potato growers. Um, on the waste thing, I think that's a really good question, Tamara. One of the things I know is that every outlet of every retailer measures waste, but they don't release that data. You can kind of understand there's a commercial sensitivity there, but I think there have been calls even to anonymize it and work it out. I think this would be a good thing to do. Um, one of the stats that I know, uh, UN figures again, if food waste was a country, it would be the third highest emitter of greenhouse gas on the planet, up there with China and America. Third highest emitter of greenhouse gas on the planet. I would imagine that box schemes will generally keep waste to a minimum because it's expensive, as Adrian says, but also they can compost it and try and recoup some of that cost. The multiple retailers have taken to um, sending their stuff to food banks, and we've seen more and more of those, which, whilst on the one hand making food available to people who otherwise would go hungry, one has to question a society that relies on food banks. But yeah, I think the question of waste is also around the breeding. Am I breeding something to sit on the shelf and look pretty for five minutes and then chuck it? Or am I breeding for something? So you get your different types of apples, your softer ones, your harder ones, et cetera. They used to store them accordingly. Maybe we need to reskill how we breed, grow, and store. I'm sure our friend Organic North does this all the time. So work out what I used to work in big fridges. You don't keep your citrus with your top fruit because that would just be silly and get water everywhere and it rots. So it's that kind of knowledge would help, I, I feel. Yeah. And thank you very much. I think you all earned your organic lunch. And thank you, Adrian and Steve, for this, and Judith for also the collecting the information and all the questions. Thank you. And online.